revolutionary technology of cloth production was central to making sense of the world. So were the textiles themselves. And this is a sentence describing pre-Columbian textiles, such as this very beautiful Inca textile with these reds, yellows, oranges. So natural dyes in cultural heritage. And I've just selected for you some of the most important dyes used in the past. Uh, yellows, the unique cultural heritage based on yellows will be then showcased by Paolo Navaj, who is, is presenting with me. Of course, blues for dyeing textiles, it's indigo, although we have several plant species that from which we can extract this color. And in his first, um, uh, in the first day, Tsvikoran also show us that this beautiful molecule is also found on the snails from which we prepare Turian purple. So if you have this kind of molecule and, and you just insert two bromine atoms, you have purple and the most precious colorant maybe from the history of mankind. So why do I bring you these molecular structures? For, because for a chemist or for someone familiarized with these structures, they, they are like haikus, you know, these Japanese poems. They, they speak words, they are really important. But I'll focus on antrochinone reds. The reds um, in, found in pre Columbian um, textiles and that were extracted from plants. So these natural dyes were applied for the textiles, of course, but also as pigments in manuscripts in paintings as watercolors and also as makeups. So extracted from natural sources, from plants, from parasitic insects as the cochineal and the karyolaca that I'm not being speaking about. So from also on turkey on reds, but from parasitic insects, I'm focusing from the ones extracted from plants. And there is a second very important player, invisible one, the metal ion here, uh, with aluminium ion. And why it is important? Because dyes are soluble in water. So in order to capture them, I need to bind the aluminium ion to the fiber, wool, linen, cotton. And then it's the aluminium ion that will capture the dye and make it permanent. This is also important for another reason, because when we are studying the science and technology of the past, assessing the conservation, the uh, condition of these textiles to be able to preserve them for future generations. We need to extract the dye, and this is the most difficult and crucial process in order to analyze them well. And in the past, people were destroying, well, maybe it's a very strong word, were um, destroying a little bit part of the textile and when the textile is destroyed with, for example, acid, very uh, strong acids, then you have the release of both aluminum and your dye. Nowadays, due to the development of mild extraction methods, the strategy is to capture the aluminum ion and, light, and then have a very good solvent to extract the dye. So we need now less quantity of fiber and we can preserve not only the fiber, but also all the chromophores that are found um, in the textile. As also already described by Tsvi Koren, Rubia tinctorion was one of the most important sources of antrachinone. In this case, I'm, the main chromophore was this beautiful molecule named the lizarin also, as common name, and it was extracted from mother roots. And descriptions of how to die with it come go back until Egyptian uh, written uh, sources. But as I told you, I'm going to focus on pre-Columbian textiles. I was really extremely fortunate to work with Richard Newman and Meredith Montag from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, studying this absolutely amazing, incredible, <laughs> beautiful textiles that are dated from 200 BC until the Inca Empire in the 50th century. So this is a beautiful Paracas textiles and we'll know more about these beautiful reds. The, the fibers were camelite fibers, for example, as the ones that you could produce from these beautiful llamas. And we are approaching the cultural context where, in which these uh, textiles were produced. So 
when it ended with the Inca Empire, uh, this was probably the largest nation on earth, but in extreme conditions because you had this fantastic Pacific Ocean with lots of fish, fish of, you know, perfect to, to feed yourself, but then these highest mountains, a desert that was really arid, a jungle. So it was really a world of contrasts and you can see it by this beautiful photo, how arid could be the desert. And maybe it's why also that we have some of these beautiful textiles so well preserved. So Andean textiles form the longest continuous textile record in world history because they were preserved in these exceptional conditions. And this spectral burial site that was investigated by um, uh, the director of the Museum of Peru, Julio Tello, provided these bundles that you see here as circles. We'll see better what is these bundles. And this was a fantastic uh, discovery with the Paracas textiles or Paracas necropolis. And this could be just to, you know, to help us imagining how these Andean people, the high ranking class school dress, so the living people, but also these bundles where the ancestors and were, were captured with these layers and layers of mantles and beautiful textiles. So our timeline uh, is focused on the Paracas. So we are really 400, 200 BC. We also study Shanghai, Nazca, and of course we'll uh, close with the Inca Empire. So this Paracas, uh, growth produced this precious cultural heritage in this oasis that were created by these rivers that, of course, uh, the mountains and the, and the waters that came from the mountains were also very important. So this is this cultural heritage. This is when it ended with the Inca Empire. And the first analysis we can take is really to go to a SAM, a scanning electron microscopy, and to see the conservation condition of the fiber, and also to have a first indication of the, uh, the mordant, the ions that were used to capture the fiber. In our case, for all the reds and all the yellows, the mordant, at least what we could detect, was uh, aluminum. So we, uh, Meredith Montag, collected these uh, two, uh, 245 samples, most of them from the Paracas, and we had 70 reds, 21 yellows, and also blues. So blues is always indigo, don't worry about it. Yellows, um, it's always very interesting to see that we have several sources of plants for the yellows, but the single source for the reds. We only detected purpurine and pseudopurpurine, yes? Eight minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, I need to go. So, and we used mild extraction methods, such the ones developed by Richard Larson and Xian Zhang and uh, Claude Andery. So, if you want to know more about this wonderful research, uh, it was done both in the PhD of Michaela Souza and of Anna Claro, and Meredith Montag and Richard Newman were really paramount. Uh, so eight minutes. I am just going to very be very brief here. So at the moment, to know more about the science and technology of this culture, we have really sophisticated analytical techniques. We can study this by Raman uh, or extracting a little uh, directly by Raman or just doing search in a micro sample. But usually, what is important is that you have you have to add a UV visible spectra, and now we have developed also a method that is quite useful to understand more about recipes and pinpoint the specificities. And this will be addressed by uh, Paula Navais in the second part of this talk. As also Svikoran has already explained, one of the most important methods that requires microsamples to analyze these dyes is, really, is using HPLC with a photodiode array detector because it allows us to collect visible UV visible absorption spectra. Based on the UV visible absorption spectra and these peaks, these peaks uh, allow us to quantify the quantity of pseudopurpurine and purpurine. So it was a Rebunian species and before the Inca empire, they were using this kind of 
purpurine by scrumble force. Why? Very quickly. This is a beautiful emission and excitation spectra. And why is this important? So this is from this wonderful textile. We analyze, we collect the signal, the floor, molecular fluorescent signal on the 30 micrometer spot, really very small. And we have this emission. And this emission tell me one important thing. So the color that I see is red. The color that is reflected is red. But these purpurines are also emissive chromophores and they will emit a photon with an orange color. So this color will be both pinkish because orange and red and also very bright. So these people wanted this beautiful chromophores. If you really want to know more about natural dyes, please don't miss the book of Dominique Cardon, also available in French. And if you want to know, you know a summary of all these fantastic discoveries by men, you can go also to my text, which is available on the internet. So I'll thank you for your attention. I'll stop the share and Paolo will take you until the world of the yellows. Some more about Paula, I'll put on the chat, a short bio note, okay? It will be available on the chat. Hello, everyone. Um, so continuing with the presentation uh, by Maria. Um, these natural dyes, the beautiful thing about them is depending on the formulations, they can have such a wide variety of colors. As we can see here, just from the same source, we can obtain all of these beautiful pinks and reds. Okay. So because there are many different ways to do these colors, they're both chronological and geographical specific. So which means we have different recipes depending on the time and place that they were prepared. So if we go after these recipes, the specificities, we can start to produce these historically accurate reconstructions. And this is just like we are in the kitchen. We have a recipe and we prepared all of these dishes. This is the same way. So we go after the historical sources. We go after recipe books and medieval treatises that really tell us how these colors were prepared. Uh, if you wanna know more about one of the works that we've been doing for the past 20 years on a book on how to make all colors, you can check our article on heritage science. So after we prepare these colors according to these recipes, we go after recipe markers, meaning um, the fingerprints using our multi-analytical approach that can really help us identify not only the source, but within the source, a specific recipe. This can give us so much information on when and where a specific artwork was uh, produced. So during my PhD, what I developed was a methodology where we gathered fluorimetry, which was already um, mentioned by um, Maria Jumel. And we get this type of information when we analyze our organic colorant. So we get an excitation and an emission spectra, which can give us so much information on the entire formulation of this colorant, the recipe, the additives, the chromophore, everything. But it's so much information that we need to have a way to simplify it, because just by the naked eye, we really can see the difference and similarities. So we use statistical methods, which we call chemometrics, to um, extract the maximum relevant chemical information. So what chemometrics does is extract the similarities and differences within our hundreds and hundreds of spectra that we have acquired. So on a first approach, we were able to very happily identify the four different sources of red organic colorants. The beautiful thing about this was that not only we were able to differentiate between uh, Brazil wood, cochineal, lac dye, and kermes, is the fact that this methodology even separated colorants from the same chemical family, meaning anthraquinones. Kermes, lac dye, and cochineal are all anthraquinones, which may be difficult to be identified because of this, but this um, methodology was able to do so. Because we knew we could go a little bit further, we decided to focus just on like that in Brazil wood, which are the colorants that we have mostly found on our studies on um, manuscripts, but can also be found in other artworks. And um, what we were happy about this is that we're actually able to pinpoint specific recipes from the same colorant. For lac dye, for example, we were able to identify five different recipes and more so we were able to um, match them with our historical recipes that um, we have studied. So because this is such um, a 
it, a methodology is being developed and it has so much potential, we know that this can also be applied to other artworks such as textiles. So this is our really our next step. Um, going a little bit back, although we have all of these uh, recipes and historically accurate reconstructions of red organic colorants, now we feel that we are prepared to go a little bit further with the yellows because they're one of the most difficult materials to identify because they fade really fast on artworks. So we have this project, Polyphenols in Art, which is funded by our, by our Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology, where we try to identify um, the polyphenol yellows in Portuguese territory. So we have the help of a botanist. So we go after all of these plant sources throughout Portuguese territory. Um, here's just a, some of them um, when we know that, for example, Genisha tinctoria was very used to dye textiles, but we don't have it as a native plant in our Portuguese territory, we find other which we call parent uh, species, because maybe these were used to replace the ones that were found in the rest of Europe. So really what we have started doing is to, uh, with using a multi-analytical approach, especially with HPLC, as um, Marie Jomel has already mentioned, we want to profile all of these plants. We want to know the sources, know the seasonal patterns, know when is the best time to collect them to get a better dyeing. Then we go after the recipes and the treatises. We prepare dye textiles and color paints. And then we understand how their, the, the photodegradation studies, so how they're aging throughout time. And then finally, we try to find the markers for all of these yellow sources, because there could be so many, and especially the recipes. So these are just um, examples of our work thus far. Um, we have uh, studied um, dyeing methods from central Iran, but we have also started to study how these um, yellow were, yellows were prepared, not only from the medieval up until the 19th century. So finally, we would like to thank uh, Euroweb because it's our role here in this cost action really to promote the importance of organic colorants used um, in textiles because we believe that the synergy with uh, historians and archaeologists can, can give fruits to so many beautiful and interesting projects. Thank you.